In this video, we are going to cover non-traumatic brain hemorrhage. This can be categorised into extraaxial bleeds and intraaxial bleeds. Subarachnoid hemorrhages are the most common type of extraaxial non-traumatic brain hemorrhage. Usually, this is due to rupture of an aneurysm, but can also happen due to bleeding from an AVM. Looking at intraaxial bleeds, there are various causes, including hypertensive hemorrhage, vascular malformation, drug associated such as cocaine, amyloid angiopathy, hemorrhagic infarcts, usually due to venous sinus thromboses, and also secondary due to an, either an underlying neoplasm or transformation of an infarct. Let's take a closer look at subarachnoid hemorrhages. This is a diagram of the circle of Willis. The most common aneurysms occur at the anterior communicating artery, at the middle cerebral artery, and the posterior communicating artery. Subarachnoid hemorrhages most commonly present with severe acute headache. Less commonly, the patient may present with signs and symptoms of mass effect due to the aneurysm pressing on nearby structures in the brain. For instance, a posterior communicating artery aneurysm may result in a third nerve palsy. An anterior communicating artery aneurysm may result in a bitemporal field defect. Let's take a look at a few examples. Here we can see there is hyperdensity in the basal cisterns, also in the supracellar cistern, and in the sylvian fissures. There is also some sulcal effacement. This is in keeping with an acute subarachnoid hemorrhage. And we can see that the patient is quite unwell with an ET tube there. This is an urgent referral to the neurosurgical centre and a CTA should be performed to look for any underlying aneurysms. Let's take a look at this second case. Here we can see there's hyperdensity in the fourth ventricle as well as the posterior horn of the left lateral ventricle and when you look closely, you can see there is a rounded hyperdense area in the region of the circle of Willis. And this is in keeping with an aneurysm, most probably of the anterior communicating artery, which has led to uh, a herald bleed. A herald bleed is a minor hemorrhage, which is a warning prior to a major subarachnoid hemorrhage. And thus the aneurysm should be urgently treated. In this case, Again, there is an acute subarachnoid hemorrhage with hyperdensity seen within the gyri and in the sylvian fissures. On this CT, it's obvious that the aneurysm is coming from the left middle cerebral artery. In this case, in which there is an acute subarachnoid hemorrhage again, there is pooling of blood in this area which suggests an anterior communicating artery aneurysm. Let's take a look at the 3D reconstruction. can see that the aneurysm is sitting here and this will need to be coiled by a neurointerventionalist. Subarachnoid hemorrhages can also be due to AVMs as mentioned. In this case we can see abnormal calcification in the left parieto-occipital lobe. This is in keeping with an AVM which has bled and caused an acute subarachnoid hemorrhage. This has led to sulcal effacement as well as hydrocephalus. This post-contrast scan confirms the AVM with acute subarachnoid hemorrhage. It's important to talk about the potential complications of an acute subarachnoid bleed when you're reporting ahead. Um, so this would include hydrocephalus, midline shift, and also the different types of herniation. And in this particular case, we can see that the cerebellar tonsils have descended down into the foramen magnum, uh, completely effacing the basal cisterns. And this is in keeping with uh, coning. Another important complication of acute subarachnoid hemorrhage is vasospasm, which can lead to infarcts. This is another patient who has had an acute subarachnoid hemorrhage, and their chest x ray on the right shows diffuse reticular nodular densities in both lungs, and this is in keeping with neurogenic pulmonary edema. Now let's focus on intraaxial non traumatic brain hemorrhages. Hypertensive hemorrhages tend to be centrally located, such as in the putamen. 
In contrast to this, amyloid angiopathy tends to be small uh, foci of hemorrhage which are peripherally based. Vascular malformations include AVMs and cavernous malformations. When talking about underlying neoplasms which can bleed, the most common cause is a glioblastoma. Uh, also, hemorrhagic METs, uh, including thyroid, melanoma, choriocarcinoma and renal cell carcinoma, have to be considered. It can be quite difficult to distinguish between a primary intracranial hemorrhage and a secondary hemorrhage due to a neoplasm. Uh, but uh, things that may help you are um, enhancement uh, and also heterogeneity may suggest an underlying neoplasm rather than a straightforward primary intracranial hemorrhage. Hemorrhagic infarcts can be either arterial or venous. Arterial hemorrhagic infarcts tend to be in a classic uh, vascular territory, whereas venous sinus thromboses can lead to venous infarcts, which are usually not in a vascular territory. This shows a large left-sided intraparenchymal bleed with extension into the ventricles. Given its central location, this is most likely in keeping with a hypertensive hemorrhage. On this T2 star sequence, we can see multiple areas of low signal, which are in keeping with hemosiderin deposition. And this is a case of amyloid angiopathy in which these microhemorrhages occur usually at the gray-white matter junction. Take a look at this last case in this video. We can see that there is abnormal hyperdensity in the left uh, temporoparietal lobe. This is not in a typical vascular territory. And when you look closer, you can actually see that there is hyperdensity in the left transverse sinus. And this is in keeping with an acute venous sinus thrombosis with associated hemorrhagic infarct. Back to our summary slide, we have summarized non-traumatic brain hemorrhages in this video.